Hello, Music Theory One. This is David Farrell. We are on video number 22, talking about triads in the second inversion today. We're going to keep moving along. We did first inversion triads recently. Now we're going to talk about these new chords, how they function in our music, and how we're going to work them into our composing. Let's do it. Of course, these chords are not new to us. We've talked about triads in all inversions earlier in the semester, but just a quick review. When we talk about second inversion, we're talking about a chord in which the fifth is in the bass. Here we have two G minor triads right next to each other, the first one in root position. We can see all the pitches there, G, B flat, and D, and the lowest note is indeed G, root position, but then we see it move to second inversion with D in the bass. Again, all the pitch is still there, G, B flat, and D, but when the fifth is moved to the bass, we do have second inversion, and I've labeled it with the numbers 6, 4, indicating the intervals above my bass, and my lead sheet symbol as well, G minor over D, telling me that the chord is in second inversion. We talked about first inversion triads and how they function, and we learned that first inversion triads tend to function very similarly to root position triads. When we're writing chord progressions, we can sort of use first inversions in a lot of the same places and ways that we would use root position triads. This is not true of second inversion triads. Let's talk about why. The reason that 6-4 chords are not used more frequently has to do with a specific interval above the bass, and that interval is the perfect fourth. It seems like an innocuous interval, but with the bass, the perfect fourth often tends to feel a little bit dissonant or unresolved. It feels like it wants to keep going forward. You can see in the illustration I've got here that perfect fourth resolves to a major third, which is a much more consonant and stable interval. And so when composers and musicians write using 1-6-4 chords, or any 6-4 chords, they have to take into account that this fourth feels a little bit dissonant, a little bit unstable. It doesn't feel like a place where the chord can rest or resolve or sit still for a while. Instead, these chords tend to be used more as ornamental or passing chords, chords that have a little bit less weight and stress on them. We're going to look at a couple of different ways that 6-4 chords are typically used, because again, they don't normally substitute in the exact way for root position or first inversion triads, and the reason is because they have this particular unstable interval in them. Okay, This is why, so now let's take a look at how the chords are used. I'm going to describe four common functions of 6-4 triads. The passing 6-4, the pedal 6-4, the cadential 6-4, and 6-4 is used in bass arpeggiation. These all describe typical ways that 6-4 chords are used in a wide range of musics. This is not just a classical music thing. When we see 6-4 in pop songs or in jazz songs, or in folk songs or anything, they tend to fall into one of these categories. I'm going to describe each one, we'll look at some examples, we'll listen to them, and then we'll have a better idea of how these chords do get used. Let's start with the passing 6-4. Passing 6-4 is characterized by a particular motion in the bass, and that is stepwise motion. We tend to see a step to the chord and from the chord, both directions. We pass right through it, right? We step to the chord and then we step away from the chord. One of the common ways we see passing six fours is moving between a triad and one of its inversions. Here we can see a passage in G minor. We start on the tonic triad and we're moving up to a one six chord. And how do we get there? Well, we pass through a passing 6-4. We pass through a 5-6-4 in this case. We step up to that A in the bass, and then we keep going to 1-6. Likewise, when we have our 4 chord later, we have another passing 6-4. We step up to that D in the bass, and then we keep going up to an E flat in the bass. Okay? This is our passing 6-4, one of our common 6-4s. We're looking at the motion in the bass as the big characteristic of the passing 6-4. We're looking at that stepwise motion. If you see big leaps in the bass, then it's probably not a passing 6-4. If you see the same note over and over again, it's probably not a passing 6-4. If you see those steps in the bass, then we've got a good chance we have a passing 6-4. Let's take a listen to this passage. As we listen, let's pay special attention to that bass line. Listen for that smooth, stepwise bass line. The passing 6-4 gives us more flexibility in allowing for these stepwise bass lines that we like a lot. Mm -hmm. 
the pedal 6-4. When we look at this chord, we're going to be looking at the same thing we did with the passing 6-4. We're going to be looking at the bass line. Whereas the passing 6-4 is characterized by steps in the bass, the pedal 6-4 is characterized by common tone in the bass, by a repeated note, both to and from the 6-4. That means that when we approach the 6-4, we have the same note in the bass, and when we leave, we have the same note in the bass. It's very, very common to use a pedal 6-4 to go back and forth around the same chord. What I mean, and we can look at the example here, is that we start on a tonic triad, we move to a pedal 6-4, a 4-6-4. Notice that the bass note hasn't changed, it's still G, and then we move back. We move back to 1. And then we have the same motion, we move to our 5 chord, we move up to a pedal 6-4, bass note stays the same, and then we go right back to where we came. These are really, really common uses of the pedal 6-4. Again, characteristic motion in the bass. The bass stays the same. This is what we're looking at when we look at a pedal 6-4. The word pedal comes from the organ. That's where we have those low notes on the pedal that just sort of sit there underneath everything. Let's take a listen to this passage, which uses a couple of pedal 6-4 chords. Again, see if you can't focus on the bass. Listen to those common tones underneath the moving chords. Another place that we will sometimes see a 6-4 chord is as part of a bass arpeggiation. That word arpeggiation, arpeggio, means to move through all the different members of a chord, to move up through do, mi, sol, and do, perhaps, or something like that. When we talk about a bass arpeggiation passage, as we look at one here, we talk about a, a grouping of chords in which we move through a bunch of different inversions of the same chord. And here we have one in our key of the day, G minor. We start in root position, and then our bass moves up. We move to first inversion, and then we move up to second inversion, and then we move back to root position. Okay? When we see this, uh, we want when we see a 6-4 in this place, it's not really functioning in one of the other ways we're talking about, but instead it's just a way to sort of stretch out a particular passage of music by hearing a lot of different versions of the same chord. Let's listen to this brief excerpt, a very simple way to use a 6-4 chord. The cadential 6-4 is the last typical use that we're going to talk about with our 6-4 chords. It is in some ways the most common, and it's a little bit unique. When we talked about pedal and passing and bass arpeggiation 6-4s, they're pretty flexible. We could see them in a lot of different ways, right? We could have a passing 6-4 almost anywhere in our scale where we have stepwise motion in the bass. We could have a pedal 6-4 almost anywhere where we have repeated notes in the bass. We could have an arpeggiation through any of the chords we wanted to emphasize. The cadential 6-4 occurs in a very, very particular space. Okay? The cadential 6-4 is always going to be a 1-6-4 triad. It's always going to be our tonic triad occurring in the second inversion. We see one here, a 1-6-4 that I've labeled. The cadential 6-4 typically resolves to a root position 5 chord, a root position dominant chord. The cadential 6-4 does not function like a tonic triad. It does not work like the home bass chord that we expect one to sound like. Because it's got that dissonant perfect fourth with the bass, it really doesn't work like a one chord. We write down that numeral, but it's just not how the chord sounds. A lot of theorists and a lot of textbooks don't even use the one here because they don't want anybody to mistake this for working like a tonic chord. Instead, it helps spread out and expand our dominant area. The 1-6-4, the cadential 6-4, tends to work more like a 5 chord. That's the way we want to think of our cadential 6-4, as a part of the 5. And because we think of it that way, you notice how I label it in my analysis. I've drawn a big bracket underneath my 1-6-4-5, and I've drawn a big Roman numeral 5 underneath. And that's to show that that 1-6-4 is a part of a big group that all functions as the 5 chord. Okay? Our cadential 6-4, again, a very specific chord, a 1-6-4 chord that happens right before our dominant, doesn't function like a typical 1 chord. Instead, an expansion of the 5, a little bit of a delay. Let's listen to it, and you'll notice when we get to that 1-6-4, it doesn't sound like we've arrived at the end of our piece. Instead, 
It's just a little bit of a delay until we get to the actual V chord. Let's listen now. Now that we have an idea about how 6-4 chords can function in our music, let's talk about composing with them and some of the guidelines we have for writing. In general, whenever we see a 6-4 chord, we are going to double the bass. That means the fifth of the chord, right? We're in second inversion, so the fifth is going to be in the bass. That is almost always going to be the note we double. Uh, it would be a pretty extreme circumstance to go in a different way. It's for your own benefit. This tends to allow the easiest voice leading. Doubling that fifth tends to be a really, uh, a really good move in terms of the voice leading for these chords. One other typical resolution is the resolution for our cadential 6-4. Our, six four, our cadential 6-4 chord typically resolves down by step, and we'll take a look at, it, at the example of that just to make sure we understand what it means. Let's look quickly at some of the examples we've already seen in this video. Here's a slide we just looked at, the cadential 6-4 resolution. Let's take a quick look at the voice leaning of that 1-6-4 chord. We notice I have all the pitches, G, B flat, and D, and that I've doubled the D. I've doubled the bass note of my chord. The G and the B flat both step down to form the notes I need for my V chord. I have a doubled root, two Ds, an F sharp, I've added the accidental because I'm in minor, and an A natural. This resolution is almost always the one we're going to use when we have a cadential 6-4. Cadential 6-4 resolves down by step. That's a saying we should start to block into our brains as we start to part right. Cadential 6-4, down by step. Cadential 6-4, down by step. It will save you the trouble of having to think about a resolution. You just resolve it down by step and be on your merry way. Let's look at some of the different chords. Here's my chord progression with the passing 6-4s. Looking at the 5-6-4, a D major triad, we can see again I have doubled the fifth of the chord, doubled the bass note, doubled the A, right? doubling that A, and notice that that octave A, I took care not to resolve in parallel octaves. I resolved that octave in contrary motion. My bass stepped up, my soprano stepped down. When I get to the 1-6-4 later, a passing 1-6-4 here, notice again I've doubled that D, and notice again that I took care not to resolve that octave in parallel octaves. One of my Ds stepped down to C, one of them stepped up to E flat. When we have these passing 6-4s, resolving the octave in contrary motion, that might be a useful thing to remember going forward. Let's look at the pedal 6-4s. Here's my progression with pedal 6-4s. Looking at the first one, my 4-6-4, a C minor triad, we can see I have doubled the bass. I have that G in the bass sitting there. And notice that, wow, the resolution is really easy. I have octaves in static motion in my pedal 6-4. I don't even have to worry about parallel or contrary there. The same happens when I move from 5 to 1-6-4 and back to 5. I've got octave Ds. I double that D in the 1-6-4 and I resolve it again via static motion. The pedal 6-4 is one of the most friendly voice leading uh, progressions we have. We notice that I have static motion in octaves and stepwise motion in my other voices. Pedal 6-4, really sweet voice leading, really easy, really nice. And one final note before we go, diminished triads in 6-4. If you think musicians had, a tr had trouble with a perfect fourth with the bass, try an augmented fourth with the bass. That's what we get when we have a seven diminished chord in 6-4 position. Just like we didn't like them in root position, diminished triads in 6-4 position are not typically used. So seven, fully di seven diminished 6-4 in major and minor, two diminished 6-4 in minor. These are chords that we are not going to see a lot in music and we are not going to use in our part writing. Okay, That means those diminished triads really only have one option. That's first inversion. And that's how we see them most typically. That's how we we'll use them most typically. And we're back to the title slide, which means you've made it to the end of another video. Thank you for watching Second Inversion Triads. We talked today about those triads. We talked about how they do not function in the way we expect them to function. They do not work like root position or first inversion triads. They do not follow the diagram that we've looked at before. Instead, they have their own rules. They play by their own rules. And we learned about some of them. We learned about the passing and pedal 6-4. We learned about bass arpeggiation and the very specific ways we use cadential 6-4 chords. Of course, we're going to be following this up in class with some writing and some analysis of our own. 
you have questions, please bring them to class. Otherwise, thank you guys for watching. Have a brilliant rest of your day.